This is EntreEd Talk, the podcast for entrepreneurial educators by entrepreneurial educators. We are your hosts, Toy Hirschman and Amber Ravenscroft. This podcast is created by the National Consortium for Entrepreneurship Education, or EntreEd for short. Hello, everybody, and welcome to EntreEd Talk. I am so excited about today's podcast. We were planning on doing this for a little while, but we finally said, let's just do it. I get to interview Amber today, my co-host, and this is very exciting because the two of us talk at you all the time, but we've never actually shared kind of our stories with you. So I get a chance to interview my co-host today. This is very cool. Hi, Amber. Hey, I'm so excited. I'm a little nervous, (laughs) but it'll be good. I'm going to give everybody your bio and and it's going to knock everyone's socks off. And I just, I just can't wait to do this. So, all right, here we go. So Miss Amber, Amber Ravenscroft is the manager of innovation for the Ed Venture Group. With an eye for design, Amber began her career at the organization as a marketing intern. She quickly found her passion in K through 12 educational programming and today brings entrepreneurship education and STEM innovation to the forefront of the Ed Venture Group's professional offerings. Amber, and how I met her, Amber serves as the program manager for the nationally recognized America's Entrepreneurial Schools and Colleges Initiative in partnership with the National Consortium for Entrepreneurship Education, EntreEd, hello, a program that has impacted over 50,000 Appalachian students with the support from the Appalachian Regional Commission as well. Amber led the Adventure Group to be one of only 29 internationally awarded Google Rise organizations for the CS Adventure Program in 2016 and was a featured breakout speaker at the 2018 National Title I Conference in Philadelphia, where she spoke of the organization's work on female students in STEM and computer science. Today, she manages a portfolio of education initiatives focused on K-12 education innovation. Amber earned her BS in strategic communications from West Virginia University in 2015 and her master's of education entrepreneurship from the University of Pennsylvania in 2019. Just recently, congratulations, Amber, with a skill for finding, framing and solving problems in the education sector. Amber's passion for K through 12 innovation has led to over 3 million in grant funding and impacted thousands of students and teachers across Appalachia and the country. And hopefully we'll find find out your amazing skills will lead to even more grant funding here pretty soon. <laughs> yeah, I know, hopefully. Fingers crossed. It's so weird having your bio read to you. I don't I can't wait till I do your interview because it's Mine's so, going to be one line. It's, it's toy. It's, it's so like closet uncomfortable, but I mean also it makes you feel really proud to have. I don't know if people often read their bios back. You know, it's it's a very cool experience. So, it is a little strange cuz well, and and the reason why it feels strange to you probably is because uh, our listeners have probably recognized that you are a very modest person. And on the podcast, you know, we say stuff about you and you're like, nah, no, I'm not. But, <laughs> but I will tell everyone, I'm going to tell all your secrets today. So Amber is a, Amber is a very modest person on the podcast. Uh, when I met her over three years ago, we were at a meeting and I was like, who is this? And, you know, because I, I knew some of her colleagues already. And then this Amber person shows up who's this adorable, amazing, beautiful person with this brilliant head. And she was super quiet when I first met her. But then very, very soon after that, the whole team realized that she was not quiet. And she is just a one of these people who decides, makes a decision, sets a goal and does it. And there is a really funny story about her moving to Chicago that I'll let her share uh, before we get into the like, you know, all of the meat of the podcast. But she makes a decision and she does not mess around. And we learned that early on and she embodies the entrepreneurial mindset and spirit. So she's been a treasure to our team and we couldn't do anything we do without her and such an inspiration. And she's super young. I'm not going to give out her age, but she can if she wants to. Um, <laughs> so she's, she is going, going places and we're just so happy to, to know her and get to work with her. So tell the funny Chicago story because we all gave you a side eye, whether you knew it or not. Oh, I know. <laughs> when you decided to just 
I'm moving to Chicago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, I mean, for everyone, like, listening, Toy's being very, very nice to me. But nope. um, I am, thank Honest. you. I am pretty young for where I am professionally, I think. I'll be transparent about it. I'm 25, turning 26 this winter. And when I started at Adventure, I was actually still in college. So I started as an intern back in 2014, October. And they were very kind to me and allowed me to go on spring break. And on spring break, I met a fella who lived in Chicago. And I came back and I told the staff at Adventure and and my president, I was like, you know, I really like him. I think we want to give it a go. And so for about a year and a half on and off, one of us was driving nine and a half hours to see each other every two weeks. And after a year and a half of it, we got really tired of that. And I like let my staff know I was moving to Chicago and Entrad team because we were in the midst of our grant at that point that I was going to be moving to Chicago kind of just because I wanted to, and like Toy said, like when I set my mind to something, I really commit to it. And so, yeah, now I'm I'm here in Chicago. I work from home and I travel back to Appalachia a lot and we're getting married. And if you ever want to deep dive into my, (laughs) my life story, there you go. But he's just one example of my, I guess, my commitment to things because I've I've never picked anything easy. Let's put it that way. <laughs> that's, that's where I'm learning that more and more. And then like in the middle of all of this, you also bought a house and also finished, a, started and finished a master's program. Yeah. So, in the last like 13 months, yeah, I finished, no like deal. started and finished that master's program. And it was, I mean, it's been one of the hardest, but most rewarding years of my life, I think. So yeah, I can't wait to talk about all the things that I've had a lot going on. <laughs> Yep. For real. We are all just totally amazed at Amber. And, and, you know, she's one of those people that you just know. She's a, she's a rock star. She's going to do, has already done incredible things, but there's so much more to come from her story. So um, just sign a napkin or something and send it to me so that I just have it. Just in case. We have, like, we have a whole portfolio of podcast toys. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> Here, okay. So I am curious, and this is going to show my naivete a little bit, but what exactly does it mean to major in strategic communications? Right. Yeah, no. So actually, it's a little known fact. There's something called the academic common market in the East Coast. There's like 13 states. So I was raised in Western Maryland, Toy, where you're from right now. And there weren't a lot of options for me. Like we could have went to University of Maryland or like Frostburg State where I grew up. And so when I went to, actually I picked my major because I wanted to go to West Virginia University and I wanted to do it at a reasonable price. (laughs) So the academic common market had a opportunity where you could go out of state to West Virginia University for strategic communications at the state cost. And so I didn't know a lot about it either, if we're being honest. I just knew that I was really good at talking and communicating. (laughs) And so when I grew up, my mom told me I should be a lawyer for like years. So I actually started school as a political science major and it was like one class and I decided I hated it. (laughs) So (laughs) I switched to do that because I really liked journalism. I liked the idea of like advertising, PR, like marketing. And so strategic communications is just kind of an overarching major that captures public relations, advertising, digital media, all those things within the Reed College of Media at West Virginia University. So it's kind of like an overarching communications major where it's more like focused on strategy. It was cool. I really liked it. That's neat because it's kind of like that manager of innovation thing to me, like strategic, I have to think about it. Yeah, no, no. I feel like every part of my life is like, oh, what does she do? That's good because that keeps you under that Batman radar. And that is a good thing. Do whatever because it <laughs> falls under this this radar. Um, but yeah, so that's really cool. So, so since that encompasses marketing, is that how you ended up going to Adventure as an intern? Like, how did you find... Ladada and the adventure team. We had a really great career um, readiness person at the College of Media. His name's Eric Miner. He's still there. And so he would constantly be sending out internship updates. And there was one for adventure because a lot of my, and this is going to sound awful, a lot of my classmates, I don't want to say sell their soul, but they go into these advertising companies where they work for these major corporations and they sell stuff to people that don't necessarily need the stuff that they're selling. So like it can be a really mind numbing career path if you go that way. And I wanted to, while I was an undergrad, experience something that I thought was meaningful. And so when I saw that the adventure group, which was a nonprofit locally, was hiring for somebody to help with their storytelling, I like immediately applied. 
And so he sent my resume to Ladada and the adventure team. And then I went in for an interview. So they got, they actually, I sat down with them in person and part of it, this is always funny because I use this a lot in our trainings for youth leadership. Part of my program, I had a whole class on personal branding And I remember distinctly the professor saying, like, if you can't sell yourself, you'll never be able to sell anything. And so we had to create like our own video campaign around ourselves and like all this marketing collateral for ourselves as students. And that's kind of what got me the job at Adventures. I was one of the only interviewees that went in and like had this video that really clearly articulated why I was the right person. So it was super cool. It was a good program to like understand who you are as a person and to kind of sell that. And so that was like my dipping my toes in entrepreneurship because I could figure out like the brand of myself. So I would say I was my first company. (laughs) I think that's an exercise everybody should have to do. I'm sitting here thinking like, I need to do that exercise. That sounds amazing. Yeah. It It sounds horribly, horribly difficult, but it sounds amazing. It forces you to get out of that like comfort zone of not talking about yourself. Yeah. You just stand in front of, um, that's when I first learned that I have a Twitch where I'm public speaking, where I play with my hair. So nobody on the podcast can see this, but I play with my hair constantly when I'm talking. And so I remember there was a guy who twiddled his thumbs and our professor was like, stop that. (laughs) So like they pick out so many things, but that's kind of how I got adventure is I just, I, you know, I took a, took a chance and went for this internship that had been sent via email and it was really cool. And I stayed with it. So. Wow. And you've done so much, you've done so much with them. When did you start working with them? Like, when did you leave intern dumb and go to full time? Was that right after graduation? Yeah. So I started in October, 2014, which was my senior year. So I knew a little bit about the educational programs that they did because I had to market them. And then the first one that I got to go to was, it was like an aftermath of the youth leadership program where we had to award certificates for students that did servanthood in their communities. And so I was like, wow, this is super impactful. They were talking about, you know, how they didn't have a lot of opportunities because it was really rural. And I remember like tearing up in the workshop and I was like, this is so embarrassing. (laughs) I was like, please stop, please stop getting emotional, Amber. But that was like the first time where I was like, this is super meaningful work because it it resonated a lot with me growing up in a rural community about like having a mindset to get out of it. And a lot of students like not even get out of it, but to, to know that they can make an impact in their own community is really important to me. And so I was like, I want to stay on. I got a little bit further involved in some of the actual implementation of the programs. And then I started full-time June 1st, uh, 2015, which was right after I graduated college. So Yeah, that's incredible, too, because of the number of people who get out of college now that are like, okay, now what am I going to (laughs) do? I know. Yeah, I felt really lucky because I knew I was going to start full time while I was still in college. And I know a lot of people, especially my capstone, were really struggling with, you know, their vision for where they wanted to go. But um, I mean, I'll for anybody listening that really wants to give their students like guidance on that piece, I just encourage them to do as many internships as they can. I did a lot while I was in school just because I wanted to experience different things. I took paid and unpaid, but more paid because I think that you should get, you should, you know, get paid for what you work and what you do. But um, I learned a lot. Like I was a research intern and I knew I did not like research. I like it in a context where I'm also implementing and seeing if it works, but I don't like it where it's just taking data and getting insights from it. That, that kind of, I struggled with that one a little bit and I knew I needed it to be meaningful. So yeah, I learned a lot from that from that experience and June 1st, 2015 started full time. Wow. That's such a, that's such good advice because you uh, most, I don't, I would, I would guess most college students don't do that. You know, I know I didn't, I saw the pie in the sky and I'm like, I'm just going to go get this job when I'm done. And luckily I was in a high demand field, but, um, and I did get a job, but there's a lot now that was a while ago. So (laughs) there's a lot now that that doesn't happen. And, and just, just knowing a lot of times what you don't like is a whole lot more valuable even than what the knowing what you do like. And, and I, my list of jobs is rather long because I did a lot of, I don't like this. So what's next? And I think that's perfect. That's what you need to do. I felt the same way about my majors. I switched my major from political science to journalism to stratcom. I mean, somehow I still graduated in four years, but, (laughs) but I think, um, a lot of time people go into one major and they're like, Oh, I need to commit to this, but you have, I mean, with general credits, you can get to your junior year before you have to truly decide. 
And I think that that's really important is like finding, because you could live a really miserable life if you stick in one that you don't like. Think about that. Think about what you don't like and try to figure out what you don't like. And that'll lead you more towards what you're really passionate about than vice versa. Yeah, that's so true. And that's like the bigger picture of our what makes you mad um, mm. <laughs> activity. <laughs> <laughs> what are you, what what do you, do you need? Need? let's start with that <laughs> yeah that's amazing so you could have gone I'm assuming many many different directions with that major what made K through 12 education specifically so education in general but then specifically K through 12 and he said you started talking about how you were at this place and you were tearing up what, yeah. what made you go, this is my home? Okay, so it's kind of twofold, right? So I first, I alluded to it a little bit is this idea that I really wanted something meaningful and that I felt like I could see the impact of what I was doing daily. And I still feel like that, like nearly five years since I started my internship, I still feel like daily I can see what, the difference that I'm making. So I'd say the meaningfulness of being in K-12 education where you're working with students and you can see that some of the opportunities that I don't think I had, I could give to them is really meaningful to me. And the second piece is I just get really annoyed with K-12 education and I want to just completely demolish some of the pillars that it's, it's rooted in right now. And so I remember when um, Gary Schoeninger was talking about a compelling goal. Mm-hmm. And I've been doing a lot of like internally reflecting since that podcast about like, what is my compelling goal? And I think my compelling goal is just to disrupt like traditional K-12 systems because I feel like they're not doing the correct things for our students today in many ways. And so I think for me, like this big goal of, I really want to create meaningful change in that industry, um, which is one of the most stagnant industries that exist in our country. And so I would say that that it's kind of, twofold is that the meaningfulness of what I can do and the impact of what I can do and also the need for it um, to be in this space and be a kind of a disruptor in that space is really important. So yes. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. That is a big compelling goal. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and we all <laughs> we we all are like there with like we're your choir because we're all there and and I won't talk about my kids school. Um but we're <laughs> <laughs> we're all we're all there and it, but it's it's a for for someone as young as you are to to feel that and see that it's just such, it's such a beautiful thing because you are a lot more relevant to the kids the that that demographic than than some of us are I think I'm still relevant I'm not as cool, but I think you're fun. <laughs> no, I love no, you have like so much energy going. I'm not here. that old. But <laughs> I think that that's such an amazing thing to feel that passion at, at where you are, especially in your career. And then and then you went and doubled down yeah. by going by getting this master's degree in lightning speed. But I want you to talk a little bit about this degree because I am fascinated by it. I was a little jelly of you. I got to I'm like, wow, that's, that sounds amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just got mine in like regular education. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of weird in that. And I, you're the same way. Like I can't sit still. I have a very hard time, like not being engaged in like some form of learning. So I, I mean, it's been four years since I graduated college and I was just getting so tired of like not being in school. I feel like I'm just one of those, like, I, it's cliche to say, but like, like a lifelong learner, I have to constantly be doing something. And luckily I'm in a position where I'm often working on new programs and that kind of stuff. But I really felt like I wanted something, um, an expertise in something. And so when we started this grant that I got to meet you and Jean and Nacy and the NCRD team, I, I just felt like my passion has fallen into the, ed- the entrepreneurship education space. And so I knew I didn't want to be a teacher because I don't think I could do it daily in the classroom. I, I really like students in small doses. <laughs> so where I feel like um, I could be their lollipop moment, right, where they like look back and that's the person that change their trajectory just by like having one workshop with them. So I have, I wanted to stay in the lollipop world, but with this master's program, I really wanted something that was non-traditional and saw education as this like vast opportunity for us to disrupt it. And so this university of Pennsylvania program is designed for people to start and launch and sustain businesses and organizations that will disrupt traditional education. So it's like a lot of people who are, you know, starting new curriculums, starting new schools, like with completely different models of education. And 
I was just fascinated, one, for getting some understanding of entrepreneurship from a functional standpoint, but in the education space. And so, um, yeah, I was 13 months. I graduated in July. Well, I graduated in May, but my degree ended in July. And um, I feel like it's just completely changed how I perceive, you know, programs. I mean, it's changed how I write grants. And it's just really changed how I view the future of education. So I, I love it. I was surrounded by a group of like-minded people, 45 of them for uh, 13 months. And they really, I mean, they changed my whole life, I would say. So it was well worth it. Some of them on our, on our podcast. And I think yeah, we'll and I, I still, yeah, we'll have more. People. Yeah. That's, that's incredible. So, and, and, and by the way, like you mentioned it, but it's no joke. It was UPenn and this was a pretty intense thing, but also it's new. Like the, the program itself is disruptive, right? Because yeah. I was cohort five. So it's been in existence for five years. It's, it's the only degree of its kind in the United States. I think they have a partner with like the Netherlands or Switzerland somewhere over there, but completely new. So like we were told going into it that like, just be, just understand that we're doing this program as like a lean startup. So like they're constantly changing the curriculum and trying to learn about what like is a best practice in this space. So we knew going into it that it was very experimental and we kind of were told that up front. From a curriculum standpoint, it's a master's in education, a master's in business, and a master's in entrepreneurship put into three. So every time we would go, we had three courses that were focused on each track. So like we learned business management, we learned entrepreneurial like introduction to finances, like entrepreneurial finance. And then we learned education evaluation and we learned curriculum design. So it was like simultaneously, which is a lot. But um, <laughs> you say it's UPenn, I didn't even know. I went into the interview I called it Penn State. And they were like, you know, you're, the, you're at the University of Pennsylvania. I was like, oh, so I had no clue. I just knew it was a really cool program. And I didn't know it was Ivy League or any of that rigor until I got accepted, just because I wasn't looking for like a, an academic program that was of prestige. I was just looking for one I, I felt passionately about. Um, and that's my, that's our rural side showing. I bet like when people think of Ivy, they think of Harvard and, and all those. And University of Pennsylvania seems more like a state school. But I didn't know that till I got into it. And I was just mind blown. And then I had a lot of imposter syndrome. Like, do I belong here? Oh, no. <laughs> no, I did. And I still, I sometimes I still feel that. But yeah, I mean, I felt like I could compete at that level. But you for sure, I was the only rural student in the whole class. Wow. Um, yeah. I'm yeah. surprised to hear you say that. That like, <laughs> that's like a little, a little vulnerability nugget that I didn't know existed in you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, like midway through it, I was really, I mean, when I first went in, I was super nervous. Like I, my, so my best friend who lives in New Jersey took me to class and I was like shaking. She's like, you're going to be fine. And I was like, I just don't think I can do this. Like, yeah. I mean, and then after that first weekend, we did like a startup weekend and my team won around our adulting idea. And so that was really like reassurance that I needed. But the whole way through, I mean, the level of readings, and the quality of work, like, I know that I'm good at some things, but it was it, a lot of doubt the whole way through it. So there you go. Well, I know, I know for one that you shouldn't have had any of that doubt, but there's a part of me that's really kind of endeared that you said that. <laughs> yeah, it was a really, Amber is like a force. Like, like she walks, she's like, I, I wish I could go back in time and give myself a little bit of Amber's pixie dust because <laughs> at, at her age, like she just, she's a force. Like she walks into a room. She, you, you don't doubt her. She's just, the, it's, it's awesome. It's, it's really cool. So that, that surprises me, but that's cool. That's, but cool. I would say, so again, like when we do these youth leadership, we have a whole section on confidence and I literally will fake it till I make it. And in terms of like presentations, I prepare so much that I know that stuff, like that I can anticipate questions. So I'd say that like, I appreciate that you perceive me that way, but yeah, definitely there's a lot of not like insecurity, but I do get really nervous. And sometimes I feel like even being so young, the perception of other people is like, how can they take me seriously if I don't take myself seriously? So it's a lot of preparation and a lot of like mental self-talk to, to be perceived that way. So I'm glad it's coming off like that. <laughs> That's so. amazing. That, and you're right. If you don't, if you don't think about that way, if you don't think that way about yourself, then nobody else will. I struggle with that a lot with my confidence and my quirkiness. Yeah. 
still working on that, but, <laughs> no, but, I think, but I think it's important to have a per. I feel like you and I both have really tangible personalities when we present too. It's just, it goes back to that idea of like being able to sell yourself and knowing your personal brand. And I think that's something that I'm working every day towards. And I feel like everybody is working every day towards figuring that out. So yeah. That's awesome. So we're kind of pushing for time. because oh, no. like, I know. I just, well, I just looked down and was like, whoa, um, <laughs> Cool. I mean, I mean, that, that was, that's cool that it was so quick uh, feeling. You are very, I know, very passionate about working with underserved populations and, and also um, females, girls in STEM. And I know that you do some stuff. I don't know a whole lot about the Google Rise stuff or the the CS is computer science, right? Adventure. Um, program and working with girls in STEM. And I did not get to go to the conference to see you speak. So I would think that everyone would like to hear more about what you do there. Cause I know that's a big, that's a big passion of yours as well. Yeah. So I'm a closet nerd about like anything I, if going back in time, I would have probably completely changed my trajectory and tried to learn and go into a field around computer science, because I just love the future of where that tech is like where tech is taking us. So actually my whole passion started in undergrad. There was a competition for target to market their threshold brand. And we had just learned in our immersive media class about augmented and virtual reality. And so I partnered with my friend Megan on this campaign that would create augmented reality showrooms and targets. And we actually won that competition. And that's where I first dipped my toes into like what the future of tech looked like. When I went into adventure, I had this mindset that this is a really powerful tech that could disrupt education. And I asked them, had they thought about anything in the AR, VR space, and they hadn't had any programming to date. And so there was a, the Google Rise RFP was a proposal for computer science focused summer camps, after school programs, that kind of stuff that would really serve underserved populations. And I was like, one, I'm a female who had no access to this. We live in a really rural area and I was just really passionate about computer science and coding with application to AR, VR. And so I wrote this proposal. It was a long shot. I remember I was working at Olive Garden because I was still in school and I got this email and it was like, you've been approved for this Google Rise grant, which I never in a million years thought we would get it. And I remember calling LaDotta. I was like in the break room in my server gear and I was crying. I was like, because it was my first big win. And I remember crying and I was like, I never thought I could get this grant. Like, and so it was a two week summer camp with grades three through eight. And we used code.org because Google's a big, big supporter of code.org. And we had girls coding their own video games. We had them completely demolish computers. So like I asked for donations of tech and I was like, okay, take them apart. And then I was like, identify the pieces because I don't think people really think about the ins and outs of tech. They kids today just think that it's a machine that exists. They don't think about the stuff that goes into it or the code that goes into it. And so They learned a little basic coding and then they got to play with like AR, VR. We learned how to make different like algorithms and stuff like that. It was just a really cool program um, and I was really grateful for it. But one of the biggest outcomes for me and why I went to the Title I conference was seeing how uncomfortable the girls were talking about it on day one. And by day five, they loved it. And it was like that whole thing that I mentioned about imposter syndrome and stereotype threat and by the end of that, we talked about that throughout the whole workshop and gave them more female focused coding activities. And so like we had significant gains on their confidence, significant gains on their approval. I remember we were doing that right around when Becky's Verizon Innovative Learning Program started. And so we had chatted a little bit about what we did with Google Rise so that she could kind of think about some of those things going into Verizon Innovative Learning. And it was so so rewarding, but yeah, so my session was on female focused pedagogy to kind of address imposter syndrome and stereotype threat. It was really cool. I was really grateful. It was an awesome experience to do that. So that's incredible. I know you're passionate. I know you, you nerd out self-professed, you nerd out on oh, AR and, and that's, that's so cool. I got to experiment a little bit with some of the, some of the educational technologies in a class that I was taking last semester. And it's really, really cool how far we've come with things. And yeah. I tried to show my kids all these awesome things, but they're like, I don't want to like, <laughs> yeah. so you talked about, you know, you know, you talked about um, presentation. So this is like a little side note. I asked for an Oculus go, which is a, like a, the Oculus rifts are the ones that are connected to high powered 
computers, but Oculus Go is a little bit more transportable. Uh, it doesn't have wires or anything like that. So I asked for that for my fourth anniversary with Jake. And so I got that as my anniversary present. And for presentations, there is a app on there called VR Speech, where you can go in and it puts you in a room with people and like, it, it measures how fast you talk. It tells you when you've done well. And so I've done like a couple of times where I've had major presentations where I'll go in to VR to get a little bit more comfortable talking in front of a crowd. It's really, they have um, interview options where you can go into a panel interview and they'll, you can like have them ask you questions and you can respond. So there's so m- so many, of wow. them. I'm obsessed with it. So that's fascinating. Yeah. I never, I'd never, I've never heard of that. I mean, I've heard you mention that name before, but I didn't know you could do that with. Yeah. Uh, that's so cool. My next endeavor is um, I want to learn a language because I'm going to be marrying into a Polish family. My last name will be Pawlitsky. So I want to learn some conversational Polish. So there are a couple apps where they say like, it's better to have a conversation and be immersed in the language. So I'm, I'm hoping that the next application will be me learning conversational Polish through VR. Wow. So I'll let you know how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> that's, and that's an interesting one. I mean, I, I get why you picked it obviously, but that's an interesting language to choose. Cause that's oh, yeah. not a norm, like what most people would pick. <laughs> it's not easy. It's like weird, weird combination of letters, but we'll give it a go. <laughs> cool. I bet his family just it loves you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. oh my gosh well I could continue this for a millennium but uh we have to close so why don't you tell everybody where they can reach out to find you and your awesomeness if they so choose yeah yeah no definitely this has been this has been really fun I was really nervous going into this I was like what are we gonna talk about you were nervous I was, I was nervous. I was, what are we going to have a chat about? But um, yeah, no, if you want to get in touch with me, of course you can follow me on Twitter or reach out to me on Twitter. It's Amb Ravenscroft. Um, we'll, we'll just go ahead and tag that because my last name's a little bit much, <laughs> but, um, or you can Wait also re- pull whatever you said. <laughs> I know it's spelled like Pavlitsky. <laughs> Pavlitsky I know. <laughs> but, you should um, hyphenate it just so that everyone's so. <laughs> yeah. I'll be like in the checkout line for two hours trying to spell my last name for people to sign up <laughs> with programs, but it'll be fine. But yeah, so you can definitely reach out to me on Twitter. We're really active on there. Um, contact me through EntreEd Talk, EntreEd's Twitter. And then if you want to reach me on email, it's aravenscroft at edvgroup.org. I'm always interested in new new things that are happening and working on programs and collaborating. So yeah, give me a shout for sure. Awesome. Well, thank you, Amber, for agreeing to be the first of us to do this. <laughs> yeah, you're next. <laughs> Mine's not going to be nearly as interesting, I know, but I'm sure our our listeners really appreciate it because it's fun to kind of get to know a little bit about who you're listening to. You know, you always want when you hear someone present, you always kind of like wonder what their backstory is or what, you know, how they got there. So this was really cool to get to know you a little bit better. So, yeah. I guess we, we will we will say goodbye and thank you everyone for listening. And I hope that you enjoyed learning more about Amber. I know I sure did. Yeah. No, thank you, everyone. If you have any questions, I mean, just message us too. We're happy to answer anything at any time, not just during the, the interviews with each of us. So yeah, thank you. This has been fun. Appreciate it. Thanks, Amber, so much. Bye, everybody. All right. Bye, everyone.